Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block, politics, perspectives, and players. From flash floods to fires and drought, our weather is changing, displacing people and costing millions of dollars in lost revenue for businesses and lost homes. Those costs continue to mount, but are we doing enough to adapt to our changing climate? Weather and climate, not what our grandparents knew, is the topic senior climatologist David Phillips is now presenting across Canada. He joins me now from Toronto. Thank you, Mercedes, for having me aboard. Mr. Phillips, let's start with your premise that it's not the weather and climate our grandparents knew. What do you mean by that? Well, Mercedes, I think that people think that the climate changes rather slowly. They're, they're probably right about that. And, uh, and, and I think that most people feel that, gee, with climate change and the change of weather, Maybe it'll be weird, wild, and woolly weather that we've never seen before. And that's not the case. I, I think it would be easier to explain to Canadians uh, a climate change if our weather was like, for example, we had typhoons in Saskatoon and, and sandstorms in Halifax. I mean, that would be something earth shattering and would be clearly different than we've ever had. But the problem is that this, it's often the same old weather, except it changes by some of the characteristics, the statistics of it. We're still getting storms, will probably still be the, the second coldest country in the world and the snowiest, but the kind of weather out our window, the kind of weather we deal with on a daily basis, we have seen in recent years, it's got more extreme, more widespread, uh, it's more intense, uh, it's out of season, out of place, it's uh, longer lasting. I used to say, Mercedes, the best thing about Canadian weather is that it hits and runs, it doesn't stand around and torment you, but what we've seen in recent years, it's taking its sweet time. And so therefore it has more time to spread its misery. It's raining on Thursday and still raining on Saturday. You get too much weather here and too little weather over there. So what I try to tell people is that our weather has changed, but it's really the statistics of weather that have changed. And, and so that's why it's not what our grandparents knew. It's not what they dealt with. Things were seen to be normal. Uh, you know, storms happened and they, there were no surprises, few surprises. Things seemed to more, not that they were more predictable, but they were more foreseeable. You know, things just seemed to happen. A hundred year storms happened every hundred years. And now it's like a, a joker in the weather deck. It's, it's just a lot of surprises. And, and I think that's the nature of weather that is different than, uh, than what our grandparents had to deal with. I know from Newfoundland all the way out to Calgary, which is where I'm from, we always said, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. But you bring up this longer pattern of more extreme weather, like drought and floods that we're seeing more across Canada. Why is that? Well, I think the fact that there's clearly a couple things at hand, it's clearly we know, Mercedes, and nobody, I mean, even people who deny climate change accept the fact that it is warmer now. I mean, the statistics are there. I mean, you get 98% of scientists around the world saying that the Earth is warming up faster and greater now than in a long time. But you can't get scientists to agree in anything. But they seem to be almost uh, in total unanimity about the fact that, hey, the numbers are there. We know the oceans are warming up. The air is warming up. It's every ecosystem on this planet is, is warming up. So certainly that's the fuel that drives storms, makes storms stormier, makes hurricanes perhaps stronger. Uh, uh, longer lasting, all of these things are, are very much important in terms of changing the weather. But there's another important thing too, Mercedes, is that, you know, besides that the weather has changed, that we have changed, society has changed. You know, we're, um, we're, we're living more in urbanized area. I, I, you know, it's sort of interesting, Canada is the, most pop is the least population density in the world, but the most urbanized. I mean, 85% 80, of us live in cities. And, uh, and those cities have different surfaces than it used to be. I mean, we are, uh, cities have more impervious surfaces, uh, uh, cement, asphalt, and building material. And so when that rain falls from the sky, it's important to know what surface it falls on because sometimes it runs off immediately, creates a kind of flooding. It doesn't matter how dry Ottawa or Edmonton is, that raindrop becomes a flood drop. And so what we're seeing, Mercedes, is more of an impact, more of a fallout more of an effect of the same old weather. So even if weather didn't change, these little hits in the past would be major blows because of who we are and where we're living. We've got more wealth. My gosh, that, that smelly old basement I used to store my bike in as a kid is probably a fitness center and entertainment room. So when that flood occurs, there's a bigger ticket item. So I think it's really a combination of the weather has changed, it's warmer, that we have changed, that our possessions have changed, where we're living. 
We want to live by the sea. I mean, a third of the people in the world live within 100 kilometers of the ocean. These are graveyards in the waiting. There's greater targets, more risks when you live there. So there's greater fallout from the, with the same old weather, but, but we also know that the weather has changed. So everything has changed, and so therefore the, the response, the effect of, of, of weather changing or climate changing is very different now. But if we are building in floodplains and paving over lawns to make room for more cars, a lot of people think about climate change and they think about CO2, they think about greenhouse gases, not so much about how we structure our day-to-day -day lives in those examples, our communities and our infrastructure. So how does that all play out in terms of climate change? Well, you're absolutely right. You know, we often focus on the fact that it's the problem is all what we're just putting into the air. The, 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 the CO2 enrichment, the over the, uh, and that clearly we know, I mean, for 200 years, we've known if you add more CO2, you're going to get a warmer world. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a, a slam dunk. But at the same time, because we're changing who we are on the surface and, and, and our possessions, uh, where we live, uh, we're cutting down trees, we're, we're draining the swamp. I mean, talk about draining the swamp. I mean, it's at our peril. I mean, the swamp and the wetlands used to protect us from nature. And now by, by surfacing it over, by, by uh, creating this impervious surface, that we see the response of the same old weather is going to be different. So I think it's an important element to realize that, uh, that, we, that we are changing because of, of what we're doing to the atmosphere, but also what we're doing to our rivers, our surfaces of the earth. And, and you know, and, and we, the, the earth has changed in a dramatic way. The, in the last hundred years, the, the land use of the planet has changed by, by over 50 percent. So forests are now becoming urban areas. Uh, um, we're seeing uh, forested areas are becoming suburbs. And so therefore, that is really uh, it changed the, uh, the kind of formula and changed the response of the of the same old uh, of the same old weather. So I think that's an important element that we have to consider in this and why why climate is changing and why why the weather seems to be beating us up uh, more and more these days. Are there things that municipal governments and federal governments should be considering when it comes to regulations and policies? And should there be more direction from that regulatory side, maybe even from the insurance side, in terms of how we're living our lives and even where we are living? You make a very good point, Mercedes. I think that's an excellent question. And so much of us, we focus on cutting back on the fossil fuels. I mean, we go to Paris, Kyoto, Copenhagen, and we sign documents that don't go anywhere. And, and you know, I think we need to cut back on our fossil fuels to wean our insatiable appetite from that. But, you know, it's not going to save the, the world. I mean, all of the CO2 that we spend going to work or school today is going to be there in 100 years. And I think what we need to do is to suck it up and say, OK, the future is going to be warmer, but it's also going to be weirder, wilder, and wackier from a weather point of view. So I think the focus has to be equally on cutting back on emissions, but also on preparing for it, accepting the fact that we're going to have different weather. It's going to impact this greater. And so therefore, we need to prepare for it. You know, we can't prevent the, the weather from coming our way. We can't prevent, but we can prevent it from becoming a disaster by properly preparing for it. And so much of our cities are thinking, well, I'm responding to climate change by encouraging renewables and, and decarbonization and uh, better transit. Those are all good things. But I and I like to live in a, a green community, but I want to live in a safer community, a weatherproof community. And some of the things that we need to do are very they're not expensive things, not like building a dome over Toronto or sea walls around Halifax. It, it's a matter of um, something you said. I mean, not building in the floodplain. I mean, that may cost you a little bit of tax uh, basis, but it's going to save your bacon in the long run because you're not going to be bailing people out. Not uh, these, these parking par uh, pods that people put on their front lawns to park that third car. I mean, we, we need to encourage green infrastructure, not gray infrastructure. And so some other th just common sense, logical things that we can do that we can cushion the blow and not necessarily make a, a, a climate change the, the boogeyman that it is, that we'll be able to handle it. So I, I think we need to understand the fact it's not about cutting just back in fossil fuels. We need to do that. But it's also about preparing for it, building better building codes, building more standards, inspecting our infrastructure to make sure it's still worthy, uh, encouraging green infrastructure, not gray infrastructure. These are not big, costly items. These make common sense and it makes life more, more bearable and more livable in the, uh, in the future. 
Thanks so much, Mr. Phillips, for joining us. That's all the time we have for today. For the West Block, I'm Mercedes Stevenson.